So let's, let's start the last talk <laughs> of this wonderful conference. So the last talk is by Len Borisov, and he's going to talk about uh, development in the robotics algebra approach to storage real estate screens. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for this wonderful conference. And uh, so I'll talk about a somewhat more esoteric area in this uh, whole business of mirror symmetry, even though I will try to convince you that it's you know, the right way of, d of, of doing it, but you know, uh, we'll see. So uh, first I'm going to give a bird's eye view of mirror symmetry. So Essentially, I mean, although everybody here knows quite a bit about it, but I want to give you my personal perspective on it. So it starts uh, with a physical construction that associates to Calabi-Yau X with a complexified Kelly cross W, uh, something called N equals U2 superconformal field theory. So uh, N equals U2 superconformal field theory is a physical theory uh, quantum field theory in dimension two. It's not really completely clear what it is, but still you know, everybody is reasonably comfortable with it. But I, I don't think there is a, a mathematical axiomatic uh, definition of what the full n equals two two is. So that's one issue, but uh, you know, never stop to anybody. So another issue is the sigma model construction itself is you know, Lagrangian formulations, there's a Feynman, so whatever you do anything is gonna be Feynman type pass integrals over spaces of all maps from Riemann surfaces. These are hard to make rigorous, just the nature of the beast. Um, another annoying feature is this uh, complexified Kelly class W, well from there you're supposed to produce a Ricci flat metric. Yeah, it exists, but can you write it? I mean, that's a, another iffy issue. So, but anyway, uh, so, so as I said, N equals two superconformal field series understood well enough so that there are some parts of it that are very, very well un, uh, axiomatized. For example, uh, you're expected to get um, A and B triangulated categories that correspond to open strings. Uh, there is A and B uh, topo uh, topological conformal field series, a cohomological field series. Uh, a and B chiral rings is kind of a part of it, uh, uh, corresponding maybe a sphere with three punctures. There are some more rough invariants, such as Hodge numbers of X, elliptic genus of X. I put it there for completeness, but it doesn't really make any difference unless the dimension of X is like 12, which physicists don't care much about. And uh, there are more yet to be discovered, obviously. Uh, some of them, I'm sure, are known to some people in the audience, just not to me. I mean, this is a bird's eye. I mean, the birds aren't very smart, so. <laughs> uh, but what I'm going to talk about today is the vertex, or in physics terms, chiral algebra approach, um, a chiral algebra aspect of the N equals to two superconformal field theory. So what it is, first of all, is think of some kind of Hamiltonian approach to quantum field series. So it's some kind of vector space for the N equals to two conformal field theory. And then there is some kind of Dolbo operator on it. And the half-twisted theory is more or less the cohomology with respect to that operator. Okay. All right. So N equals to two conformal field theory has a natural mirror involution. I'm not gonna say what it is, but it's relates to just the sex trend equals to two structure gets flipped. And uh, pairs of calabi and complex Kelly class are called mirror to each other if the corresponding n equals two two superconformal field theory obtained by sigma models are, are mirror. This has a bunch of mathematical consequences. For example, dimensions of this axis have to be the same. Uh, the Hodge diamond flips in this rather strange way. And then you get a uh, uh, Kansevich uh, homological mirror symmetry that Foucault category on one side is the boundary of category coherent shapes on the other side. 
Uh, then the uh, classical mirror symmetry is that some Gromov of Witten invariants correspond to calculations obtained from periods of Yukawa couplings on, on the other side. Uh, there's probably more to be discovered. And again, in this talk, I'll focus on the statement that a vertex algebra constructed from one Calabi-Yau and uh, Keller uh, involution is mirrored to the vertex algebra constructed from the other pair. As you'll see later, I'm cheating here a little bit, um, but uh, but that's the that's the that's what this uh, vertex algebra approach is all about. Like, so the next slide is, is crucial in, in my propaganda you know, um, speech. I, so uh, you have to, I have to explain to you why you should be interested in, in, in this approach. Well, it complements other approaches. You know, it's not. It's not an alternative approach, it's just, you know, it's just one other wrinkle of the story. It leads to a rich algebraic structure because you get uh, vertex algebras which have n equals to symmetry. You'll see, I mean, it's really some kind of, for an algebraically inclined person, it's a great object to look at. It's closer to the full structure in n equals to two theories. So I think that's, for me, the most important selling point, it's not, a, it's not a topological theory, it's really a conformal field theory. So you have a better hope of actually getting to two. Now, uh, the two other uh, bullet points are recent developments. So I, I recently figured out a way how to propose a unification of Batryev's or more generally flexive Gorison cones uh, mirror symmetry and Burton Hoops version of mirror symmetry. It's a uh, preprint about a year ago. And then another uh, recent work joined with Ralph Kaufman is uh, doing the same formalism, but uh, to study toric uh, zero two sigma models. And I'll talk about those at the end, but first I need to uh, just give a background because although, yes. Uh -huh. Some kind of some kind of extra data complexified uh, Keller class. What do you mean? Which one? This one? Yeah, for me, some kind of complexified uh, complexified Keller class. I, I'll never really talk about it. I mean, so any 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 details, aren't, aren't, you know, it, the details aren't really so important to me. So you'll 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 see that I don't. Uh, uh, you'll you'll see, you'll see why. I mean, uh, it's not that important to me. Now, okay, so I need to remind you what the vertex algebra is. That's, the, that's the, you know, the first psychological barrier that people have with this approach is that you need to b feel comfortable with vertex algebras. The problem is that the first definitions of the vertex algebras go about roughly like this, uh, about half a page of data and you know, a page of axioms. and uh, Lately, though, I mean, lately, meaning 10 years ago, it's been refined to a point where you can actually say, it, uh, say what it is and not be completely you know, bogged down in details. So what it is, it's a, first of all, a super vector, sp vector space over complex numbers. And then there's a very unusual structure. This is maybe not so unusual for physicists, but for mathematicians, this is a very, very bizarre, you know, unexpected. That's, that's, you know, really very strange from a mathematical point of view. It's very unique. You don't find it in other areas of mathematics. It's called state field correspondence. And what it is, to every element of the vector space, you associate a, a formal power series with endomorphisms uh, uh, coefficients and endomorphisms in this vector space and is a formal variable z. Now, all right, maybe it's not all that horrible if you just have an associative algebra then to every element you associate endomorphisms. And this is some kind of, you know, a loopy version of it, if you wish. Okay? Uh, there's also an even element called the uh, vacuum vector. Again, think of identity in your associative algebra. Uh, now, 
these guys have to satisfy a bunch of axioms, but a bunch of meaning of four. I don't mean 15. And I'll point out a couple of them. One is the one that's sort of hardest to satisfy in practice, but it's very essential, is that uh, this uh, formal power series, they almost commute with each other. If you write the double power series made out of the super commutators, then it's going to be annihilated by z minus w to the n as a formal power series. Now, if, if, if z and w were actual numbers you could plug in, then you would say that these guys commute except when they collide, when z and w collide. I mean, from the axiomatic point of view, it's better to just work with formal power series. Uh, but um, anyway. And then the other important uh, axiom is this vacuum axiom that if you take y of a z and hit it, uh, and hit a vacuum vector with it, meaning uh, hit uh, all those AKs and endomorphisms, so you hit a uh, vacuum vector with them, then what you get, you get A for the, for the z to the zeros power, and everything else is just positive powers of z. So as a result, if you know your y of az, you can recover a by taking a limit as z goes to zero. So this y is called a state field correspondence for a reason. It gives an isomorphism between uh, states, the a's, and the fields, this formal power series, y of az. Okay? Now, so this is a vertex algebras. What are n equals two vertex algebras? Well, it's a vertex algebra with an additional data, which made out of four fields, G plus, G minus, J, and L, and uh, such that if you look at the Fourier coefficients of these uh, fields, the modes in uh, physics terminology, they have this very specific supercommutators. Uh, so the Ls uh, give you a Verasora, the Js is affine U1, uh, I, mean, I didn't want to write it down because it's not really important for me. You can, you can find, well, it's actually not as easy to find <laughs> it written out, but n equals two. You have to go back to papers around 1990. There it was more commonly written out. Now it's just kind of referred back. But you know, it's, it's just commutators. Uh, nothing nothing um, terribly tricky. What's important is, this uh, any n equals two vertex algebra has a very natural mirror involution. It's an identity on the vertex algebra, and it just uh, messes up, uh, uh, it flips the extra structure. G plus goes to G minus, J changes sign, and uh, Virasora stays the same. All right, uh, let me talk a little bit more about the structure of this vector space. I mean, everybody prefers finite dimensional vector spaces to infinite dimensional vector spaces. And uh, in, this, in, in good cases, this vector space, V will be finite dimensional, or rather it will be graded with finite dimensional components. So let me get to it. Uh, there are, in, in this L and J fields, there are two special uh, Fourier coefficients, uh, L of zero and J of zero, which commute with each other and diagonalizable. Well, this is what I want, want to happen, so you just uh, postulate it, and in all the cases you, you need is going to be more or less obvious. The eigenvalues of A0 will be called, uh, typically called conformal weight. Eigenvalues of J0 are called a fermion number. Uh, a holomorphic one in, this, in, in, in what I'm going to do. And then, uh, is diagonalizable, so you have uh, decomposition of V into direct sum. Now, uh, here's the next definition, and I just made up the name, so it's not a standard terminology. I hope it will be standard, but I don't really care. But uh, <laughs> the point is, uh, the, uh, the n equals two vertex algebras that you really want to see in this business, I mean, they have they're, they have extra nice finiteness, or uh, it should somehow relate to unitarity, but I don't have this concept yet. So, but uh, the finiteness goes like this. So first of all, all this uh, great double graded pieces are finite dimensional. And uh, second, they're zero except for 
uh, except if they lie on a certain lattice in a certain cone. So first of all, the conformal uh, number has to be integer. I'm sorry, the fermion number has to be integer. The conformal weight minus half of fermion number has to be integer. And there have to be inequalities. Uh, so the fermion number is bounded by a twice conformal weight. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, right, so in, in cases of interest, I believe they actually have a parabola. parabola. Absolutely, absolutely. But uh, that comes from uh, having, you, you may also put extra, extra axiom of having a spectral flow, but, and that would more or less take care of it, but, uh, you know, well, but, but you need, right, 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 right. It also, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the truth is, the, the truth is, in, in cases of interest, I, I haven't bothered, quite bothered proving it, but I believe it shouldn't be that hard to prove that you would actually sit inside a parabola like that. Right. Now, uh, what's great about um, this half-twisted approach is that if you twist it one more, you can get either A ring, uh, A, A, A uh, a twist or a B twist. And here it looks as follows. So, it, so in this cone, you look at the sort of the extreme, the extreme parts. Because there's actually a parabola, it's actually only a finite, finite set of uh, uh, entries here. And uh, the A ring is part on one side, the B ring is part on the other side. And then uh, those uh, uh, Y of AZ they're actually, if, if you just take them from here, they'll actually commute with each other. Somehow, the, double, the fact that there's nothing to the left of it tells you that uh, the structure of the vertex algebra gives you a super commutative uh, structure. And uh, that goes, I mean, the typical reference for the stuff is uh, Lercher, Waffer, Warner. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very neat. So you really expect to recover the A ring and the B ring from the data of, the, of this vertex algebra. Right. The mirror involution in this setting just automatically switches A ring with B ring because it changes the sign of the eigenvalue of J0. Just renames them. That's all it does. All right. Now, let me remind you that I was uh, claiming to try to construct vertex algebras for the Calabria varieties and uh, extra structure. And uh, from a mirror and show that they're equal but up to a mirror involution. So the first crucial issue is how to get algebras from Calabi Yaus. And that's where you run a little bit of problem, which uh, is the following. So there's a so a lot of the story has started in ninety-eight from a very interesting paper of Malik of Shekman Weintrop where they construct the cohomology of Carl Durham complex on, on X, on a, any variety X. So what it is, is, is you take a BC beta gamma system, you spread it out, uh, you write it locally, you write the, the transformation formulas, so you end, end up with the shift of vertex algebras over any variety X. If X is a Calabi Yau, it's a shift of unequals two algebras, and then you, you can take its cohomology. Now, when you do that, you're going to be obviously missing instant on corrections. Basically, because it's a shift, so it only sees things locally, it doesn't really see any instant ons. So, what you, what a second guess of how to construct a vertex algebra is try to construct a quantum cohomology of a Carl Zeram complex, but it hasn't been done yet. I don't, I mean, it may, it may, it may not be so horrible, but there are some technical issues. Uh, Probably the biggest technical issue is that there are about you know, five people in the world working on it. <laughs> uh, on a good day. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you, I mean, so there's Malikov and co-authors, and there is me, and. Uh, Apart from Malikov and, and me, no one's, well, there are a few people who've been working on it, but uh, a lot of it is sort of not full time. So Now, 
what one can try to do, though, is, all right, so you don't have quantum cohomology. Let's try to deform the cohomology of Carl Durham ad hoc. Just, you know, right, calculate it and then see if it deforms nicely. It's actually, you know, been done for quantum uh, cohomology at, at some point as well. So it's, it's a reasonable approach. So, all right. Uh, so next I'll just, I mean, next I'll describe how you construct this vertex algebras. Just sort of the answer. <laughs> Missing all the definitions. In the, uh, Bach, in the setting of the Bacharov's mirror symmetry. So I need to remind you what Bacharov's mirror symmetry is. So you start with dual reflexive polytopes in uh, dual lattices. Then you lift them at height one in extended lattices. So just imagine kind of taking a polytope sitting in co-dimension one lattice and taking a cone over it. And uh, then the reflexivity corresponds to the fact that these two cones are dual to each other. So this is the data of dual refractive Gorenstein cones and dual lattices. Uh, then you pick generic coefficient functions. So there are some lattice points in delta, some lattice points in delta dual. You assign to each of them a complex number in a general way. And then the two Calabi Yaos that would come from your families are resolutions, uh, or before resolutions for dimension three, you can do usual Krepant resolutions of uh, this proj of C of K, some. Uh, of uh, fm of x to the m, what it is is you take a semi-group ring of the lattice point inside this cone, um, take its proj, its a toric variety, and then the coefficients define your hypersurface in that toric variety. Now uh, you can say, well, that if you have you can have different preference resolutions. Uh, for my purposes, I'm going to completely ignore it. So what's important is that it's not easy to make identification between actual pairs of x1 and w's. Because the w, the scalar class, should correspond to a specific choice of a hypersurface on, on the mirror side. But the correspondence is this by this mirror map. It's this ugly, well, beautiful, uh, <laughs> transcendental, <laughs> transcendental function constructed from uh, solutions to a picard fuchs equation, let's say in a quintic case. <laughs> oh, that's right. The red pointer is better? OK, sure. All right, now let me give you the answer. And let me convince you that this is a, a, a beautiful object. All right, so first you start with a free field algebra. Uh, so you, it's a lattice vertex algebra. You start with uh, free fermions and free bosons based on the lattice and its dual. And then you write, uh, you, you want the free bosons have zero modes along that lattice. Uh, for a mathematician uh, not familiar with this, uh, uh, with this, um, with this uh, conformal field theory, what it is, roughly the size of it, is kind of like infinite. Its polynomial ring is infinitely many uh, even variables, many odd variables times uh, the group ring of the lattice. So nothing terribly complicated. It's a large space, um, but it's not, it's not really curved in any way. It's some kind of very flat. Now, the vertex algebra, so the answer, if you wish, should be the cohomology of the space with respect to this differential. So what is this differential? I mean, I, write, I wrote it, but I need to explain the notations. The f of m are the coefficients. Uh, the sum is over lattice points in polytope delta. To every element of the lattice, there is a fermionic field associated to it. And then there is also this e to the integral of m bosonic. That's what was called the vertex operator originally. 
is the if you wish it, it's the field that corresponds to the va vacuum shifted that's corresponding to this uh, element of M. So this is a formal power series in Z and, and the same thing from the mirror side and you take the residue. All right, so the vertex algebra is the cohomology. It uh, inherits the N equals two structure from the ambient space. So here's the formula of the n equals two structure that it inherits. So these guys, they, they all commute with the differential, super commute. Uh, what the structure is, is roughly the flat structure, but then there are also corrections uh, related to this. Uh, there are extra, extra special elements in these lattices that give you the grading on the two cones. And uh, they, come, <coughs> they come into definition on n equals two structure. Uh, the central charge is the rank of the lattice. Minus two in the hypersurface case, in more general, it's minus twice the product of degree and, and degree dual. Yes. Yes, I, yeah, I'll, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. That's, that's, that's the, what distinguishes this from a traditional approach. That's why I really didn't care much about W. We'll, 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 we'll see. So what I want to stress that's in, in blue font is that <coughs> it's not so obvious to see that the, diff, that the cohomology will, will, have, uh, will be of sigma model type. The original uh, lattice vertex algebra has lots of elements of the negative conformal weight because it didn't start with a positive definite pairing. It's a pairing of M and M dual. But once you take the differential, you actually get uh, this bounds on the conformal weight and uh, <coughs> on the conformal, on conformal weight and the fermion number. And so they're far from obvious, but again, uh, it takes maybe you know, 10, 20 pages. It's not like defining virtual classes on <laughs> Brahma Britain variance. I mean, it's not that level of not obvious. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a calculation, it's a theorem, but it's more a commutative algebra and a, and a bunch of spectral sequences run back and forth, but it's nothing, nothing to be afraid of. <coughs> so let me uh, state, uh, talk about the key features of the approach. Uh, the construction of the level of uh, this, uh, it's a Hamiltonian approach, so it's the space of states for the half-twisted theory. The A and B rings appear as the subrings of cohomology of the same vertex algebra, so it's a because it's a half twist. Now, here is the interesting part. Now, the parameter space is this Fs and Gs. So instead of taking a variety with the Keller form on it, I just take the starting data to be a variety in the mirror. Well, because it looks nicer this way. <laughs> uh, or more precisely, because also because I can't do it any other way. So there are limitations. Because I am using a variety in the mirror, this approach is not geometric. So it doesn't connect to SYZ, uh, very algebraic, as you see. Uh, the vertex algebra, you know, they're ad hoc. There is no n equals 2, 2, but that's perhaps one can try. I mean, certainly it would be interesting from the physical point of view to take this differential and see if you can do it with the anti-holomorphic uh, guys as well, however you want to do it. Uh, there, there is no cohomological field theory that would require going to curves of higher genus. Uh, it's not impossible, but uh, that will probably get messy. Uh, does not accommodate open strings, probably shouldn't because half-twisted uh, there are issues with open strings. You don't expect them in a half-twisted theory without some, some, some further ideas. And uh, so far, only successful in the toric setting. That's probably more uh, the consequence of who's working on it. But uh, there are advantages. So mirror symmetry is built in. Right? If, you, if you go back. All the mirror symmetry does, it switches two lattices. Okay. So mirror symmetry is built in. 
it's, it's very much rigorous. So in, in flavor, it's closer to this completely solvable system as think of a sort of a really, uh, really w a way of going a little bit beyond Gepner model variable still, still algebraically. It's non-perturbative. So I think that's a good selling point. So you really, you're not working in the, in the neighborhood, in a, in a neighborhood of a, of a large uh, uh, Carroll structure limit. So you don't, so you, you know, because you're just using um, the things in the bulk on both sides. You can do various non-geometric models. Uh, that means uh, there are some uh, Gorenstein cones. They don't really correspond. They correspond to some correspond to complete intersections. Some don't. Uh, so uh, also in a rich algebraic structure with an equal to super uh, symmetry. Uh, elliptic genus is just a graded dimension of this uh, double graded algebra, so it's um, immediate. Now, uh, in the last uh, year or two, I, I now can see that it, it can be applied to related problems. And that's uh, the recent developments, which I'm going to talk about now. So there are two uh, preprints. Uh, one is unification of uh, butter of some Bergen hoops uh, versions of mirror symmetry. And the other is the Torx 02 models. Uh, I don't think there's exact titles, but it's uh, uh, um, maybe it is. The preprint numbers are exact, the numbers are exact right? <laughs> that for sure. Yes. Um, maybe it is. Uh, okay. So now let's talk about the first one. So uh, Bergen Hoops version of mirror symmetry was proposed about the same time as Bachrev's. Uh, and for about uh, 15 years afterwards, I was under the assumption that Butcherev's symmetry just completely covers Virgil and Hoops, uh, which was um, uh, not the case. And uh, this was explained to me by uh, Kreutzer about three, three years ago here at the uh, Stringy Conference, um, that uh, no, they actually are different. And then uh, about two years ago, uh, Mark Kravitz um, kind of developed a combinatorially complete series. So what you start with, you start with the polynomial uh, in n variables, which contains n monomials. Uh, there are some very difficult to satisfy conditions of non-degeneracy. The uh, singularity of uh, the corresponding hypersurface should only be at 0, 0. That makes it almost close to Fermat type polynomial. There are uh, some exceptions. You can put in a, a, a single variable here and there, but it's close to that. And then uh, the duality that Bergen Hoops proposed simply uh, means switching the transposing the matrix of degrees. And then Kravitz gave a definition of the group. So, it all, so you have to have a group. Uh, that preserves the W, it's a part of the torus. So that's why everything here is really toric. And uh, Kravis had a definition of the dual group. Uh, early examples were done already by Berglund and Hoops and other people, but he has a complete definition. So my contribution to the subject is that, uh, first of all, I, um, there's a very easy combinatorial way of putting it into a toric context. You just define free lattices with uh, bases whose pairings are given by the degrees of the monomials. The determinant of that pairing is not one, so the lattices are not quite dual to each other. And the choice of extra groups precisely refines the lattices to make them dual. And then the mirror symmetry, the bergen hoops mirror symmetry, is just the switch of the two lattices, as before. Now, the vertex algebra that, you, that correspond to Bergen hoops are given by exact same formula. You take the Fox space of these two lattices and you mod out by this differential. Uh, the FMs, they're arbitrary non zero numbers. There is somehow, uh, uh, there aren't really any, uh, any parameters uh, in, in that uh, Bergen hoops story, but you can put in non zero numbers if you wish. Uh, the delta and delta dual. They are the list of the monomials. So it's almost like Bachrev's. There's slight difference. The, those two sets, they're not really um, 
dual polytopes, but they're almost dual to each other. They're not far from each other. And the key common feature that if you take the cohomology with respect to this differential, then it is of sigma model type. And then you can obviously propose an obvious unification, which is just say, all right, let's write, let's try to look at arbitrary, let's try to look at arbitrary uh, cohomology with respect to arbitrary differentials of this form so that you have a, a, a vertex algebra uh, of, sigma, of sigma model type. So the tension here is that Delta and delta dual, they have to be non-negative on each other uh, uh, to make this uh, guy super commute. But if you make them too sort of positive on each other, then the vertex algebra will have too much stuff left in it. So they have to be almost dual to each other. And I can go in details, but, but uh, let's not worry about it. Um, so that's the essence of the unification. It's, it's a very much work in progress. So there are, for example, I don't have quite a combinatorial description of this uh, condition that you need, needed only a commutative algebra description, but still it's, it's, uh, it's doable. Now the next uh, part of my talk is the Torx02 models, uh, joint work with Ralph Kaufman. And Essentially, it boils down to being able to understand at the level of half-twisted theory a remark, well, a, a, a little bit of uh, in, in, at the end of Witten's uh, phases uh, paper. So the 0-2 model is a sigma model, but you replace a tangent bundle with some other vector bundle. Uh, typically, you can think of it as a deformation of a tangent bundle. You want some conditions of the term classes, so deformations would work. So the example that uh, motivates us is, uh, let's say you have five generic polynomials and five variables. Think of uh, the, uh, the degree four, each of them is degree four. And think of them as generalization of partial derivatives of a quintic. Consider the, the same polynomials multiplied by the variables and the quintic is just the sum of uh, this xi times gi. Uh, the tangent bundle to the quintic is the kernel of a map from the tangent bundle of CP4 restricted to the quintic to the normal bundle. But uh, you, can cons you can look at other maps from this uh, tangent bundle of CP4 to the normal bundle, and those other maps are precisely given by these GIs. Uh, so this uh, E is the kernel of this map, and to this data I expect to associate a uh, vertex algebra, and here's the answer. Uh, you take the usual uh, reflexive polytopes for the quintic and the dual, and uh, then you write something that looks very similar. The differential looks very similar. The part that corresponds to the mirror, the G of n, that's unchanged. Here, instead of just having m fermions, you have some other, you have some other things that are linear and fermions. Uh, F upper i sub m is the coefficient of the, the monomial m of this polynomial, of the i's polynomial. M i is just a standard basis vector of this lattice for the quintic. And um, we can prove just about, this, just about all you can prove, everything you can prove for the, uh, uh, for the 2-2. Two, two. Well, you don't have a full and equals to structure. There is still J0 and L0. You still have sigma model property. Uh, I'm not sure if it's actually stated in the paper, if it's, but it should, it should, the argument should go the same way. And you can see Kalabi, Yell, and Dow Ginsburg correspondence in this setting. Uh, it should be applicable to more general hypersurface computer session and toric varieties. And uh, let me show on, on the new slide what I'm talking about. So here's a general ansatz of how one should write, try to do toric uh, sigma models. And that the n equals to two symmetry is uh, you take some sets delta and delta dual. 
they have to be non-negative on each other. They have to sit in some hyperplanes. That's uh, another condition. And uh, you see, for people who know how to write the OPEs of these gadgets, if you take, if you want to show that this uh, field supercommutes with itself, you want to take its OPE with itself. Uh, if you take OPE of any of the M terms with each other, they're just all non-singular. If you take OPEs of the M term and the N terms, then there is the fermionic stuff that gives you a pole of order one. And there's the bosonic stuff, which gives you a zero of order pairing of M and N. Now, if the pairing of M and N is positive, then it's at least one. And the, and the simple pole of the fermionic OPE is just canceled out. We're not worried. If the M dot N is zero, then there is the fermionic OPE by lock is non-singular because there is a numerator m dot n in there. So when you write a nonsense like this, and this is automatically uh, a differential, and you just need to check that the quotient is, has a sigma model property. N equals zero to symmetry, it's a little bit more subtle. So you, uh, I expect that you need to write something that's linear in fermionic fields and something that's linear in, in uh, fermionic fields for the other lattice. And uh, there are some conditions. Basically, whenever M and N are dual to each other, uh, the corresponding linear terms have to be dual, dual lattice elements, du dual vectors. So uh, this could, I mean, this is a, it's an interesting modular space. I, you know, it's very new, so I haven't really studied it. So you can think of it as some kind of moduli space of zero two models. And it's, again, it's a challenge to figure out what, what it means geometrically. But at least algebraically, it's very well, it's pretty well understood. I have to point out that if you want to calculate, say, OPEs of fields uh, of conformal weight seven in this algebra, yeah, I mean, it's doable in theory. I bet that the calculations go pretty horrible because you need to probably do a Grubner basis gazillion times. But in principle, it's algorithmic. So, all right. So this is, you know, we're getting to the end. So I want to advertise for the whole area. So as I said, there are about, you know, five people working and working in it. So what do you need to understand? My stuff is just you know, a little bit of conformal field theory, and, and it really is a little bit. Free fields, you don't need to be an expert on uh, moonshine module or anything like that. Uh, you need uh, some knowledge of commutative algebra, basically speckle sequences and, and Kazoo resolutions, and then that's all we're talking about. And geometry, maybe for motivation. But of course, you know, whoever you know, comes in will bring their own stuff with it. So um, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> well, well, you, you see, he has a fork. I mean, I'm not sure what he's going to do with it. But, <laughs> but you, can, you can make your own assumptions. All right, that's all.
we should have a talk with because I'm also a speaker, but uh, uh, let's thank all of the speakers, um, except me. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>